a big blessing. Okay, we are live. So thank you both for that. And I could see you heard about the bird uh, experience. I did, I did. Yes. And so I've shared some of my bird experiences. We're all bird people here. Mm -hmm. So I just, I want to welcome you both first. Thank you, Pearl. Uh, Zaf, just so that you know, Dr. Pearl Subin and I are childhood mm. friends. We go yeah. back a long way. A long and ride. we practically grew up in the same era. We, we grew up in the same era, although we had uh, our lives had uh, moved in different directions, but we always had the connection, I would say, Pearl. It was always for there. sure, for sure. And uh, Zaf, I'm not sure whether you are like us. We are Generation X. We are a crazy bunch. <laughs> Probably not. Are you Definitely millennial? Like... Are you Z? Which one are you? You know what? I'm just me. I don't know all these gems <laughs> enough, but no yeah, generation. Yeah. <laughs> but, I'm, but, I'm, but, I'm, but I'm but I'm from the nineties. So uh, uh so born in the so yeah. <laughs> you're probably a millennial. Millennial, yeah. probably, yeah. yeah. Millennial. Okay, you guys are quite interesting. I'm very interested <laughs> in you guys. <laughs> Which is very... funny because even though I was born in the 90s, I love what happened in the 70s and 80s. So, oh, that's beautiful. like I've been there. You know, yeah. I have a brother who was, you know, uh, Pearl, uh, Christopher was born in 1980. Now, what's the odds that him and I, us, we all grouped into Generation X? That's and then true. Ashley, Younger, our yeah. brother, is a boomer. He's a boomer because... Yes, he, yes, that's true. Just and missed then it, Eugene, yeah. Chris, and I all fall into X. Gen X, uh, yes. Gen, yeah. Gen X. So I think you, uh, Desiree, and Eugene would also be X. How interesting. Oh, that's true. That is true. It's true. Very, very interesting. So here's how, well, welcome to the show. I am honored. I'm deeply honored. And as you can see today, I'm Team USA. I'm honoring <laughs> that has given a credence to my work and, um, uh, you know, just taken me to where I am today as a digital artist it's through the united yeah. states and the wonderful link i have a wonderful link with the united states in fact i consider myself uh, american and south african because of that beautiful link that the people of america have created with me and from here i created that with them mm. there is well you know the, the, the commonality is love we, we have everything else you know everything yeah. else that the world has you know academic uh, value artistic value we have all kinds of professional uh, 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 value to this whole relationship which is important mm -hmm. however love carries it love lights the candle every time uh, we uh, acknowledge each other and just uh, revere our presence in the world so today i am team usa people there you go so pearl you are representing australia and south africa for sure so, for sure, for sure. <laughs> binational there you go binational so uh i want to thank you for, for coming uh, and making this time because uh, i know it's around 7 7 30 on your end it's about 7 p.m is it it's about 7 p.m. That's true, exactly. which is not late at all. So thank you for having me, Michelle. You're welcome. You're welcome, Paul. And, and the show, the team is also honored. They they all, uh, whoever's, I think it was uh, uh, someone on the team that uh, 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 was in contact with both of you. And they said you were yes. very gracious to them. And you were very understanding. And you were very au okay fait with all the information sent to you. You oh, just went for them. So they yeah. love that. So, uh, Zaf, thank you for your presence. You are a very honorable man from what I've learned in the short time that you have become my friend. You have good mm -hmm. values and you're just a good, decent human being. And I like that about you. You're also very creative, very talented, and you're a very strong entrepreneur in the world doing great things with your life. You've overcome many things. And that is why we add value to your story because you have the power to help many people. We've all overcome many things. There is none of us that hasn't had some kind of adversity in life. Adversity mm. is common to all human beings, you know, uh, and so therefore you're in a good space today. And thank you for your presence, Zap. And then I want to thank our Facebook audience. There may be one or two people watching. And um, I 
thank them for coming, for logging in at this time of the morning in South Africa. Pearl, I'm not sure if Melbourne will at some point come in because it's your evening there. However, people mm -hmm. always look later on because uh, mm -hmm. our show is on demand. So without further ado, because we have both of you and Pearl has a comprehensive program, you're also doing a, a presentation for us, Pearl. I don't think so. Maybe it will just be our discussion today. Oh, well, it's no. just our discussion. Okay, well, you, you're welcome. It's, it's, it's okay. I mean, I think it will cover everything, though. Okay. <laughs> yeah. you, whenever you want to bring your presentation or if you want to post sure. it on the show page, you're welcome to do so. You oh, have, thank you, Michelle. That's a very generous offer, yeah. Yeah, if you want to post it on the show page, just, just let us know right sure. to Andre or whatever, but we, we will arrange that for you. And um, so let's get started. And I think uh, since Zaf is the newbie pearl, you know, we, we women always give the guys a break. So they say ladies first. Today we'll turn it around. How's that? I think that's <laughs> absolutely fine. Absolutely fine. <laughs> so Zaf, I think yeah. the first, um, we'll, we'll give you a chance to go first today. And uh, since you're representing our city, our, Pearl and I are very much in love with Durban. No matter where we go in the world, yeah, we, that is we will be... Uh, Durban girls. That's first that's love. The first, first love. love. Our yeah. first love is Durban, Zaf. So you're in the city of honor. You know, no matter where we go in South Africa, Durban for us, the Durban girls, it's the city of honor. So Zaf, the first question is posed to you. Um, so there we go. Oh, there we go. Zaf, what has been the most painful part of your life? And have you healed? Thank you so much for that question, uh, Michelle. You know, um, yeah, the most painful part of my life, you know, I, I sat and thought about this. You know, I've been through so many life-threatening challenges and I just wrote down a few, right? So I overcame bronchial pneumonia, which basically took a lot of my life. Uh, my mom getting cancer, also stressful as well. Uh, me getting a life-threatening tuberculosis that was growing by my spine heading to my brain, managed to heal and beat that naturally after having 5% of my right lung breathing capacity only. And, uh, you know, losing my pet parrot that I mentioned, all of this uh, life-challenging uh, situation, losing my granddad at the age of nine, because that's how far back I went. But the most painful part, I would have to go down to high school and primary school bullying. And, uh, you know, it, it it's really mentally challenging because I've met and know people that went through it and couldn't cope and took their own lives. So that biggest battle is in the mind. Anything in life that happens, it all begins in the mind. If you have an illness, you can heal your body through your mind. So we all have one thing in common. We have the ability to think. But unfortunately, I do believe that the education system is broken because they tell you what to think, but they don't teach you how to think. And mm -hmm. that has been one of the most painful situations in my life. And also... Uh, you know, just to get a bit personal as well, watching my dad, uh, you know, lose himself and limiting himself to what he could do. And eventually those little limiting beliefs destroyed his relationship as well. And mm -hmm. I saw how that uh, happened. And I said, you know what, I, I got to end this in the sense where I got to move forward in life and not become what that is. And I began helping people. So I'm obsessed with mental health. I've helped a lot of people and I'll continue to do so. So yes, uh, peer pressure and stuff like that. I would say those are some of the toughest battles, but there's hope out there and I'm here to help guide people. Beautiful, Zach. That was, you know, well presented and also very thoughtful the way you uh, answered that question. Uh, were you bullied as a child? Um, in school, yes. And uh, I would like to say that it started from uh, grandparents, right? Uh, old school mentality in new school times. And I like to tell people that no kid no baby is born a racist. Every baby is born uh, with, with an abundance of choices, but it's the parents that install that. It's like you buy a cell phone and you install the software and now the software is on your phone, right? You have the ability to remove that software if you don't want it. Same with the mind, but unfortunately, we become so conditioned into believing things like don't go there at night because of maybe one bad thing happened to someone doesn't mean it's going to happen to you. No one's telling you to go into dangerous areas. You can go out at night. It's safe. You just got to know where you're going. So with that, yes, uh, I have been programmed as a child to think a certain way until I began to think for myself. And guess what? Those people then said, you know what? You think you're too good. Well, I just have a different understanding. I'm not better than you. You're not better than me. We just have different understandings. So I began to program myself, remove myself 
from family because they refuse to see what I'm doing is good. And that's okay because I've met hundreds of thousands of people worldwide that sang my name on the stage and not one family member showed up. My mom was there at my pillar. My sister was there at my pillar. And that's all I need. And that drives me forward in life. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. That was beautiful. Yeah. And it's a whole new take on bullying, right? Because everybody speaks about school bullying and everything else. And people go right past the family bullying. So thanks for mentioning that, Zach. And that, that's so oh, inspirational, though. That is very so good. Much. Very yeah. much. So, Paul, you can you can have a cross discussion with Zach on that if you want. To. I I just think it's 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 so inspirational because uh, you know Zach, you've been challenged by so many life experiences. You know, it's so much has been uh, obstructional, but you've managed to rise above that, and that's you know it's, it's such a good role model for the young people who you must be interacting with. I think that's wonderful. Thank wonderful. you so much, Paul. You know, just to touch on that, uh, you know, I. I used to play a lot of video games until I came back to South <laughs> Africa when I was living in Saudi Arabia and I realized, oh my God, I spent 60,000 Rand on PlayStation 3 games. What the hell was I doing? <laughs> and now my book collection is bigger than my PlayStation collection. I haven't oh, touched the PlayStation the in five that's years. The, the PlayStation actually died. It will not come on. So that's a good thing. But anyways, Thank I focus you. my energy on Thank that. You and the... that. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah. So as an academic who is an advocate for anti-racism, Yes. What's your take on critical race theory? Very controversial question. Yeah. Well, no, controversial probably because people don't want to acknowledge what it is. It's a bit of a different take, but I'm glad that they have mentioned race, race and racism as well. Um, essentially, critical race theory, or now it's called CRT, is a framework, and um, it would have originated in uh, in the legal system in in the USA in the 1970s. And, um, you know, it's, it's reflecting on how race intersects with other aspects of disadvantage. So racial inequality, as we know, is embedded in almost every society. Um, I don't think there's any society anywhere that we see uh, where there's racial neutrality. I haven't seen it yet, and I hope we see it soon. Uh, but I think, CRT challenges that narrative and it says that you have to spotlight racism. You've got to spotlight race. And instead of ignoring it and saying it doesn't exist and saying, oh, let's become colorblind, it's actually saying, let's, let's think about how racial bias has actually changed our world. And so it's challenging to some people, like you said, it could be controversial because most people who um, hear about it, want to say, well, you know what, we can't apologize for the past, so let's just move on and let's pretend that it didn't, all those racial inequities didn't exist. But you know what, we we can't. We, if you ignore the fact that I'm a person of color, you are ignoring all the challenges I face. You know, it's like Zaf was just telling us about the, the, the challenges he's faced. It's made him who he is at the moment. And I think Absolutely. all three of us, the fact that we are people of color has made, has made us. It's, mm -hmm. it's constructed us. So mm -hmm. CRT is saying, yes, we acknowledge that. We acknowledge the fact that you would have experienced personal prejudice. You have intersections as, as a person of color. And that overlap, I think, is important when we think about CRT. Wow, Paul, that was brilliant. A very, very, as I said in the question, what is your take? That was a brilliant take on it. And I think you would have answered many questions from even the naysayers. And I think you oh, have yeah. the power. Yeah, yeah, I think you have the power <laughs> just with how you have explained it as well. You do have the power. And that is why I do value a well-studied person speaking on certain subjects. Thank you, Michelle. You're always so generous in your, in your praise. <laughs> you so do really. value that. Because you bring a take to it. It's not just hearsay and, you know, everything else. This is a solid background of research, engaging with people, traveling to the different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. Thank for you sure. for that. For sure. Thank you. So we'll, we'll go to Zaf again. And Zaf, you coach people online and you're very compassionate to other people's life crises. Why do you think that empathy is key to caring for others? 
All right, wonderful question. You know, it's something that uh, people tend to ignore. And, uh, you know, when when you go all the way back uh, to, to childhood trauma and what kids go through, it's like when they are faced in a situation, the common uh, reply or response from parents is just get over it. You know, it's done. But mm-hmm. it has settled into the brain, into the into the subconscious mind, and now it's in the conscious mind and always play at the back of your mind. And the reason why I always have empathy, one thing I realize is, we all go through similar challenges in life, but we all have different experiences, right? And uh, in, in order for you to understand someone, you got to put them into, you got you got to walk into their shoes. You know, you cannot say, oh, I went through that as well. No, you haven't. You went through your challenges. And by saying that, you devalue what that person went through. So in that way, I always find common ground with someone. And uh, I work so much when, when it comes to gratitude. You know, what are you grateful for in life? And I put that in and the people that I help with that simple routine, every morning, 5 a.m., I have a routine with myself and business partner and we put down what we're grateful for. The reason why it happened at 5 a.m., if you know what you're grateful for in the beginning of today, no matter what task comes to you later on in the day, you're already programmed to basically overcome that. And I would like to tell people that no matter what you're going through in life, if you find something, if you find your purpose in life, you will basically find the direction in where you need to go, no matter what people throw at you, because remember something, God is always standing behind you and in front of yes. you, and there's no one else that can that's greater than God, right? So you find that purpose and empathy. You know, I, I wish when I was growing up, someone was as compassionate as that to me uh, in, in, in my family, besides my mom, but I never had that, right? So I became that pillar of what I want to see. I became that, and I'm helping other people through that. I mean, COVID happened. A lot of people... Uh, you know, suffered through that. They chose to suffer. Remember something, pain is inevitable. Mm -hmm. You'll always go through pain. You cannot avoid it. Suffering, however, I've learned is a choice. You can be in pain and not suffer. You can suffer and not be in pain. So those two things that I've learned in life that I've been helping people and helping them find the good and bad. I mean, you may drive on the road and someone may may have met an accident and out of the five people in the car, four died. And the one person is uh, alive and saying, you know, why why god why why am i alive well you know the question is why not you you have a purpose now to go on you've been given a second chance in life and now you can build on that you know so uh, always find something good in something bad and you can move forward in life and uh, empathy is is truly truly powerful in that in that uh, phase yeah thank you very much for, for that zap that was beautifully answered and uh, it's it's lovely to know that uh, a young person, someone like yourself, who is doing what you do in life, uh, you have such a high level of compassion. I think it's the highest uh, human trait we can have to be compassionate first before we are anything else because uh, there are so many hurting people in the world. And Mm -hmm. uh, just by being kind and compassionate, We can heal. We are called to be each other's healers. And we should all have it in us to heal every single person, whether we know or do not know what they are going through. Because um, I love your take on how you reach out to people as well. And I'm sure you're seeing great results in your coaching business. Thank you, Zach. So, Pearl, How have marginalized communities benefited from your research programs? And can you elaborate on the programs? Well, um, thank you, uh, Mitch. That's a good question. Um, I've been researching into inequities for many, many years. Um, As you are aware, I I left South Africa, my Mm -hmm. uh, beloved Durban, (laughs) Um, and, uh, you know, um, immigrated to Australia a, a long time ago, and the the whole concept of inequities sat very heavily on uh, who I was as a person as well. So I think that from the time I was very young, I was aware that I, you know we we are empowering marginalized communities through the work that we do. And look, I'm I'm very very inspired by uh, Zaf. I think Zaf, you we were teasing you earlier about the fact that you're from a younger generation. But you're so knowledgeable. It's so good to hear, uh, you know, the work that you're doing. Michelle herself is a member of the 5 a.m. club, by the way. <laughs> I tease her about that too. But anyway, <laughs> I think as well that, you know, keeping in mind that, you know, young people like Zeph come out of disadvantage. That is that is some of the, the you know, the motivation I think that I need as a researcher in order to advance what I do as a um, 
an anti-racist advocate and advocate. But I think thinking more about my research program, I've been working within schools, uh, a particular focus on racially responsive teaching. Um, Australia is a huge multicultural community. One in three people in Australia are overseas born. So as you can imagine, there are race groups from across the world in Australia. Many, many people choose to settle in this uh, great South land. So, you know, at the end of the day, I want every student, all students to feel valued, seen, respected, experience a sense of belonging. And so much of my work has been around that. More recently, I've been looking at uh, uh, developing curriculum with some peers on how to reflect these diverse perspectives of different race groups and different cultural backgrounds and so on. I work in teacher education. So a lot of my work as well in inclusive education is to prepare teachers to recognize and acknowledge um, differences in classrooms, to, to sometimes even address the biases that they are experiencing as, a, as an individual as well. Um, Zaf was talking about bullying and yes. bullying often is one of the, the heaviest weights that some children mm -hmm. carry at school because you know they that that's the challenge. And remember, if color becomes the reason that someone is bullied, it become it becomes enormous. So I I, I don't want that to happen to any student. So mm -hmm. students are often you know cast into the background or marginalized because of race or language sometimes. Mm -hmm. And what I'd like to do is to ensure that every student has an inclusive experience where they are engaged and they get the best out of their schooling in other words so yes advancing that through my research exactly what i want to do you, you know that the color of one skin can significantly yeah. impact learning contexts and mm. that shouldn't be happening yeah marvelous thank you paul that was so insightful you know <clears throat> speaking about how the color of one skin reframes how people look oh, at yeah. you yeah. And we try not to think about it, but it's actually, it's there out in the world. And it's only when you engage with people and people get to know you and, mm. and different cultures and races actually become one that you're seeing beyond that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, from my line of work, it's about imagery. It's about For uh, sure. you know, yeah. think being evocative and, and the human brain and mind is is structured in, in in such a way to perceive we are perceivers mm -hmm. and if racism enters the perception in my opinion well i i guess this is the truth it's a destruction your brain is really messed up then and to deal sure. pearl you know you would uh, verify this you know in terms of your uh, uh, your, your instruments that you use to measure and uh, perhaps, Zaf, you also, look, we're people of color. We engage, you know, we have our own inner gauge here. <laughs> the thing is, to deconstruct that mindset, it takes a lot of tenacity if, you would, if you're willing to go all the way. You mm -hmm. can win. Nelson Mandela won. He did win because his personal assistant, he went across the color uh, 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 lines. He crossed the line, so to speak, because some people would have said, why did he choose a white Afrikaner woman? You know, he could have chosen a black woman or an Indian woman or, or in South Africa, a colored woman. But he chose a white Afrikaner woman. And she still, here's the, the beautiful part of it. She still tells his story in the most beautiful way. Which so I, mm. it is. It's amazing. It's such you know he he was doing things that were beyond people's understanding at the time, because his mind was not broken. He was imprisoned. He was mistreated. He was just misunderstood on so many levels as a human being. But his mind, like yours, Zap, like mine, and like Paul's, life will never break us. We rise. So, Zaf, let's talk about your life of entrepreneurship. How did you become your own boss? <laughs> wow. All right. So, you know, just a quick background on that. I never had the money to go to college. And I think that's a blessing, right? So I got to see what's happening out in the world. So I researched and I looked at, you know, what the average person does in America. 
And at the age of 25, I only had 500 rand in my bank account, which if you guys are watching from America, that's about $23. And that's all that's I had. Um, and I like to tell you know, I like to tell people that if you have that amount in your bank account, more than that right now, you, you're better off than what I was. But my mind got searching, right? So I came across network marketing. And one thing I find about the concept of that, no college, no university degree will ever teach you about how powerful this industry can be. And they help develop leaders so through that industry, I've met world-known celebrities, uh, actors from Netflix series Vikings. Uh, we became best friends. We WhatsApp buddies. Uh, Pete Cohen, my life coach, came through that. And uh, he came through a Muhammad Ali post on Facebook. And I began to get inquisitive and see what's happening there. So I joined a network marketing company. I got in contact with a guy. I was reading Think and Grow Rich at the time. And the chapter Desire, I still remember today, is what resonated with me from that entire book. There's a lot of good stories there, but Desire basically resonated with me. And uh, I managed to plant a seed in this guy's mind without even meeting him personally. And eventually, you know, by continuously messaging him, eventually he spoke my name in London when he was speaking at a ceremony there, not ceremony, sorry, a, a convention there. And uh, I was crying. My mom, my mom and I were in tears because this guy literally makes like 60 million rand a month kind of money. Mm -hmm. And he made time for me. So I worked my way into his mind. But we took us about four and a half years to open up that company in South Africa. And through that, we've helped tens of thousands of people countrywide and worldwide through that. I didn't know that what we launched in South Africa would have helped my mom through cancer, which she managed to get after that. So in that sense, I before all of that happened, I was working for someone, right? And uh, I was a PA. I like to tell people I was a very underpaid PA, right? Literally 4,000 a month, right? But I was grateful for that. And one thing I had in my mind is that I would never, ever stay in a job for more than three months because once I started a job and I saw how much I can make and I saw my lifestyle and my dreams of what I want to get began to basically narrow down and say, no, this is not for me. But the most painful part of that job was because I'm a PA dressed in suit and stuff, the boss told me one day, go wash the van. And I was like, what? Like, go wash the van. You heard me. And, you know, I, I it broke me inside because, you know, I don't mind doing it, but I'm wearing a suit. And that's when everyone else saw uh, this thing, uh, you know, what I was told to do. And I told them at the end of the day, you know what, no amount of money can buy me over and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not this. Mm -hmm. So I took my final paycheck and I left without any notice. And uh, the next boss that I worked for, he gave me an opportunity to run his company. Even though I had no experience, my leadership skills kicked in and I managed to help him there. And till today, he basically sings my name and, you know, he looked at the impact I made. So from there onwards, I joined a network marketing company. I coached a two and a half billion dollar company online with zero university degree or college diploma. And it brought out the best in me. Then from there onwards, I was interviewed on ITV News, over 350,000 viewers. From there onwards, I was featured in the newspaper. Radio Al Ansar had me on. And I began to see the opportunity before me and how far I've come. And it still overwhelms me that, you know, if you're hungry enough, you will succeed. So my life now basically is helping people with their health, physical and mental. And I launched my own coaching platform, which will go live very soon. The website is almost up and running. And my main goal here, Michelle and Pearl, is to take mental health to schools because I've been a victim of high school bullying mm -hmm. and I've seen how poorly mm -hmm. teachers handle the situation where they just let it go oh. and they don't care. Mm -hmm. There's a big loophole there for knowledge yeah. like this that are, that's mm -hmm. hungry. And I think schools need to teach mental health and how Absolutely. to be a better yeah. person. Yeah. That's something yeah. they don't teach. Yeah. So yeah, that's what drives me. That's wow. excellent. That is brilliant. And also it was such a, you know, a, a heart rendering uh, uh, answer that you gave because it's your own experience, especially about mm. that boss. Uh, I know. Who asked you to wash the car. Couldn't he take his car to a car wash? He was a boss. You know, I, I used to, I have this slogan that I used when I had the foundation and I still uh, stand by this. Cruelty is not an option. No. Mm. It is not an option. And therefore, I, I really value both of you from the different parts of the world uh, here on this call, uh, in this show, because we have to do everything it takes to end this in the world. Whatever it takes, our, our voices uh, on platforms like this, storytelling, whether we write books, whether we uh, produce a play or create an artwork, whatever we do. I mean, Zap, you sitting in front of an artwork created by your mom, right? 
No, no, it's a friend that gifted it to my mom. Yeah. The friend gifted it to your mom. And, and, the, and, and the center of it is the parrot. The yeah. parrot. And, and obviously yes. the friend knew the parrot. So look at the love. And this is why yeah. I think art is so meaningful. The interconnectivity of, of love produces art, produces art in its various sure. forms. Sure. Performing and artists, uh, there is an artist in every human being. Pearl, your work is also very artistic in its way. Travel. Artistic, yes, for sure, for sure. It, it, it's therapy. It's therapy. Yeah, it's therapy, and, and that's that. That's essential. I mean, we've now compartmentalized mm. life into therapeutic yeah. and all of that, but we were created with all of this. Those were innate human qualities. We've eroded over the years because of what you just described, Zach. Cruelty started to take over. And I'm glad that you're winning financially. <laughs> Yay to you. Because for sure, for sure. I want to see young people like you and not so young people like you who have had hurt and disappointment because life is so cruel. People are so cruel. People do cruel. But you, but you know, one of one, one of the inspiring things again about Zaf is that he's self-made. He's self-made. There yeah, you go. absolutely so made and, and such an inspiration to young people. Absolutely. absolutely. Nobody yes. made you. you. You did it on your own, and I love that because my story <laughs> is similar. Paul knows my story from, yes, yes. Uh, from when I, I matriculated and I, I, I had a big dream to go to university. But my father mm. had other plans over my life. And initially, there were a lot of tears over my father's plans for my life because I had oh. a different. And I wanted to do what Pearl is doing. <laughs> what to do That's you? true. And you would have been fabulous at it. Yeah. I wanted to do that world, you know. But my dad had a different plan. And I also uh, see it as God directing my life through what my father did. Because here I am doing the same work. And it's touched the world. That work has evolved yeah. from that to this. So we, we have difficult journeys. We have tears. But we can't smile at the end of the day. So, Pearl, I have to ask a very personal question. You you left us in South Africa. I you did. To a long time ago. <laughs> it's, so long. it's 25 years ago. So yes, it's a very long time. Yeah. A very long time ago. A lifetime, actually. The democracy was only five years old. You oh, it was a very young democracy, yes. Very very young fledgling, democracy. yes. All the glory days and, you know, a lot of new, new uh, developments. But you did experience it. And since your family is here, you still continue. Yes. And thank yes. God for the internet. You mm -hmm. continue mm -hmm. to keep in touch. And mm -hmm. you are the kind of woman you will keep in touch with everything. <laughs> You're not out of, out of the loop. So, you know, what I need to ask is, have you ever experienced racism in Australia? Do you know, Australia is like any other country in the world. Um, and like I was saying earlier, there is no racial neutrality in the world at the moment. So Australia is not racially neutral. Um, the experiences in this country for me are different from the ones I experienced in South Africa. South Africa had uh, a more systemic form of racism. You know, it was institutionalized. So it was part of our legal system. It was very explicit. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think in Australia, it might be a little more embedded. So what we sometimes call the microaggression. Yes. Um, I think racism is a reality in any country. My experiences in traveling and being in Australia, being in South Africa, have you know created that determination that we need to address these inequities. Um, I think Australia has made many strides to address it, um, like other countries in the world. It's it, like I said earlier, it's a multicultural society. It prides itself on diversity. Um, but in order to address the fact that racism can become an issue, I think there have been many programs and initiatives within the country to address some of those. And I think one of the, I think one of the most promising um, initiatives has been to acknowledge the indigenous people of Australia. Yes. They face significant disparities, you know, in, in areas like healthcare and education and employment and even within the criminal justice system, unfortunately. So many Indigenous Australians are um, incarcerated. There's a disproportionate number who are, who are jailed compared to other race groups as well. Many of them have lower life expectancy. And so you, they experience greater poverty. So I think one of the 
um, one of the most promising uh, initiatives in Australia is addressing that. And the other, of course, is the other form of racism is attached to in, to immigration. So, you know, Australia had a white Australia policy in the 1970s where they favoured certain ethnic groups over others. And um, and now, of course, there's, there's been a very direct move to address all of that. So I, I think that there's been strides in that regard. But look, I, I think that being said, mm -hmm. we shouldn't be accepting anything. Racism manifests itself in casual ways as well. You, you and I know this. You know, someone can make a joke mm -hmm. or an offhand comment or um, treat someone stereotypically. And as a result, that interaction can have such a profound impact on someone else. I mentioned microaggressions earlier as well. This is a very subtle form of racism because it can undermine someone just through language, you know. So uh, speaking about they or you people yeah. or marginalizing someone by just using different names or not being able to pronounce someone's name properly or something like that. Yet, you know, people are, are people of color or people from immigrant backgrounds often expected to uh, to pronounce an angular name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so Martha. yeah, I, so I you need this in. This is marvelous, beautiful discussion. Go ahead. Yeah. So I think like I said, racial discrimination and prejudice and bias can exist in any form. Uh people of color find a way of overcoming that racial stress somehow and thrive in, in a country like Australia. But that's a good thing about Australia in terms of that because it's still giving you uh, you know that fair go in a way. I think one of the, the the more positive things as well is that it's being increasingly acknowledged, and you know there's lots and lots of public discourse about it, and it's gained traction over the last couple of years. Uh, yeah. There've been government initiatives, like I said, so lots of advocacy, people like me and other community organisations. So this, you know, confronts it and it dismantles lots of what we are experiencing as well. Hmm. Oh, wonderful. Uh, one, uh, well, one very uh, I would say it's an out there question in a sense. Have you lost friends because you do this kind of work? Oh, I, I, I think that social justice work is not for the faint hearted. <laughs> it, it, it's not, it's not, it, 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 I haven't lost friends, I have to say, but but <laughs> I think that it, it requires a different kind of mentality because, you know, you are you are not speaking about something comfortable. You know, you, you can have a warm and fuzzy conversation and everyone mm -hmm. feels, yeah, you know, like that, that makes me feel so comfortable. But when you address racism and you're addressing things like Islamophobia or something like that, mm -hmm. then people are not comfortable anymore. And, you know, yeah. then it's it, it changes things. So like I said, no, it's not, not for the faint heart. <laughs> well, thank you for saying that because, um, well, we want to change the world. We do, yeah. But there's a price to pay. There's always a price to pay if you want to change yeah. the world. And and so thank you for that, Paul. That was very, very insightful. And I'm so proud of the work that you're doing. In fact, this interview is giving me such um, an in-depth look at your actual world. Oh, that's it, really kind. Yes, uh, I'm seeing it now from a different perspective. because I know, But thank I know you for spotlighting it. You're very kind to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's an important discussion. And the thing is, I know Paul the academic, the, the Shakespeare box. I you know, know, I know. I, I haven't been teaching Shakespeare at university for a long time since long time. moving into the social justice space. Yeah. It's marvelous. It's but marvelous. yes, but Zaf, I'm a bit of a Shakespeare buff. So yes. I know <laughs> I know it's it at odds with everything, but I just <laughs> it's very much a part of who I am. <laughs> yes, yes. It's your passion. And yes. uh, you're very good at it too. So uh, that's wonderful to know. So Zaf, I have to ask you. Have you ever experienced racism in South Africa as a young man, as a millennial? Um, I wouldn't say racism, but I did face uh, stereotypical challenges. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, I did go to a Christian school and, you know, we, we blended in very well, I would like to say. But when 9-11 happened, I was the only Muslim kid in the school and I was dubbed a terrorist by a few yeah, people. Yeah. That, and that yeah, affected yeah. me. Yet, yeah. I do not know those people, do not know what happened. Here I am here, but automatically the mind went like that. You know, the mind is always searching. If you search for problems, you'll find it. Yeah. So I was picked on that. And mm -hmm. it really hurt me because, you know, I come from a place where I love to forgive. I love to give love and I love to help people. And here's someone progressing that. But 
when I took a walk into that person's life many, many months later when he invited me over for a birthday party, I saw how he treats his parents and it was it was sad, the words he used oh. against them. So it, oh. it made me think that, you know, this person is really troubled inside. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I continued being who I am. So, uh, you know, because you're born a certain way, you haven't been asked for God to give you your looks. It's been given to you as God wanted to. And for you to edit that and change that is to say that, you know, my creator's work is wrong. And I do believe embrace what you have. So in that sense, you know, I became a pinnacle of hope where whenever I speak to people, you know, I, I speak to them as human beings. There's no barrier of religion, race, whatever it is. I believe there's only one race and that's a human race. And I went forward teaching that and uh, I became loved worldwide. I and mean, if I come to your house and you're a Hindu and you're doing whatever you're doing, yeah, I'll partake in that because we all are mm. equals, right? And stuff like that. Where I go to, ch I've spoken in churches as well, bear in mind. And uh, so I, I, I love what I do. And, uh, you know, for me, just to spread out there that, you know, this is the Islam that I'm part of, the mm -hmm. Islam that teaches people respect and love, not those people who think they know what they're doing and uh, they do the bad things. So uh, in that way, I do believe myself, I am uh, I carry the flag of my religion on my back and in my heart, but I wouldn't preach it to anyone because I keep it inside and I treat yeah. you with love and respect and that's the best mm -hmm. way to go forward in life. And it's also, it's very authentic, Zach and Pearl, because how often we have been, um, we've been disappointed by people, you know, mm -hmm. Uh, from certain religious groups because um, uh, they're not who they want us to be. They're not necessarily that, but there's that push, you know, and then there's all these layers of microaggressions as Pearl yeah, yeah. spoke of. Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily just from one race to another. Sometimes the same race inflicts that upon each other and then you get you know, so levels, exactly. levels yeah. of society yeah. and, it, and mm -hmm. it's, it's extremely sad. And uh, so how do we alleviate this burden in society? I think, I think it's like Zach was, Zef, Zef, sorry, Zef was saying earlier, I'm anglicizing your name. Um, I think it, 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 when, when you look at it, sometimes you realize that the trouble, uh, you know, he referenced the idea of going to a friend's home and realizing he speaks disrespectfully to his parents. And you look at this individual and you realize that the, the hurt is on the inside, the trouble's mm -hmm. on the inside. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at someone who is racist, you understand that they are broken on the inside. So the idea would be what's happened there that's kind of wired that person in that way inside. It's a system failure, in other words. And in order to, to address that, you almost need to say, you need to rewire your thinking. You need to change your perspective. You know, so... Um, when, you, when you think about addressing racism, what can we do as, as human beings to address the fact that some, per, some people see color as a barrier? Mm. You know, it's not just enjoying the fact that everyone's different. You know, you look at the box of crayons and you realize every single color has a function and how lovely to have the box of crayons. But if someone is saying one of them doesn't work, then it's, it's problematic straight away. So it's almost like you are asking them to rethink their perspectives, you know, to to rethink the fact that race plays such a dominant role, is being seen as an obstruction, or you know, in in one of the more developed countries, for example, if someone's last name doesn't match the Anglo name, hmm. it could become challenging, and therefore you might lose out on a job opportunity. Yes, you know, with a younger person who's hmm. applying. Um, you know, that becomes a challenge. So when we think about the manner in which race might be nuanced into the way in which people operate, mm -hmm. that it would be problematic if they saw color or they saw race inequity as being the first lens that they would use mm -hmm. to interact with people. So that, that is a problem. So I think in, in my case, I, I'd like to think that more recently I've been building a bit of momentum for anti-racism. Mm -hmm through education. Um, I've been mentoring some younger teachers and collaborating with colleagues and communities to foster this culture of critical thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm also aware that I, I'm, it, it's like Zav says, I want to equip the next generation. Um, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm older, uh, like you said, Gen X, you know, so, and so I, I attend conferences and, and run workshops and conduct public discussions like I'm with you now where you know we talk about this very openly 
and talk about strategies that individual communities can use um, in order to address racism. Hmm. Well, that's wonderful. Mm. You know, this is uh, ad advocacy in, 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 in an, on another level. And uh, I know you do travel the world regularly. You're going across the planet practically. You were in Indonesia recently. <laughs> you're on your way yeah. to Cape Town. And from Cape Town, you're heading to Manchester. I know Manchester's got a couple of problems. They could deal with. I they, know, I know. They could do with some of what you are teaching. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> could very much do with some of what you're teaching and you know um one thing i've learned is that expats and funny enough uh, a friend sent me uh, a bunch of videos uh, that were made on tiktok where an expat okay. was talking about how lonely he is and he's th th there's various uh, aspects uh, of the human condition that he's going through which you mm. know we can help this man but here, here are the range of feelings and emotions that mm. one is suffering from. Loneliness, embarrassment, yeah. regret. Mm. Uh, uh, I'm there now. How do I go back home? And then things have changed in South Africa since sure. this person has made the move. If he came back here, he wouldn't be able to afford the lifestyle he wants to have here, which he thinks he has there. So he's got that there, but he has it with a whole lot of loneliness. Whereas oh. here he could come and alleviate that problem, but he has mm -hmm. to give up that, he'll have to give up his salary. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so these are the crises that people are facing. Mm -hmm. And how would you, as uh, well, you know, you're an academic, you're teaching this, you're probably uh, also developing the curriculum in some way. If I know you, you would be doing that. And, well, as a PhD, I think that's very much what you would be doing. You would be de developing programs and developing curriculum to teach across the board. Mm -hmm. oh, but you're also a compassionate woman, a deeply spiritual woman. We both come from that background where we reach people with that's compassion true. in that way. Mm -hmm. So how would you reach out to somebody? Because you've survived you know, all the ranges of it, being there 25 years, as you say, it's a lifetime. You practically grew up here because you went there as a youngster and now you are here, you've arrived. So how would you help someone who's gone across the world and you know suddenly starts feeling lonely? Would you say go back home or do you have tools and just mechanism for people to survive in that situation? Because we don't want people committing suicide as well. We no, no, of course not, no. No, I, I think loneliness as a uh, as an expat is very real. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in the early days, I think, you know, if someone said, here's a ticket to South Africa, go back and sit and resettle, I would have gone back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you were so busy making a living when you first arrived that, you know, that yeah. wasn't an option. Yeah. But I think um, if a person truly cannot overcome the loneliness when they are offshore, going back home to South Africa might be one of the options. But the other option, as you know, is to do the hard yard and stay where you are, because it is going to involve a little more work. Mm -hmm. um, you're not in your natural familiar surroundings when you go overseas. Mm -hmm. You have to adapt. And there's a lot more work to do when you are, you know, adapting and finding a new sense of who you are and redefining yourself and getting used to this new location, in other words. So mm -hmm. I think it does take a great deal of adaptability and resilience because there are going to be problems, there are going to be obstacles, there'll be setbacks, but you've got to push forward because you went there with a, you know, with a reason. But like I said, there are many, many South Africans who return. I discovered a platform on social media the other day called Return to South Africa because people see that um, this is the country of your birth. And the only place that you are ever going to feel completely at home, and I can say this comfortably as someone who has been overseas for over 25 years, the only place that you feel entirely at home is in the country of your birth. Nowhere else. You can travel the world. Over. <laughs> but the, the place that you feel most connected to mm -hmm. would be the place where you were born. And a friend of mine was speaking to me the other day about going back. You know, each time you go back, do you feel a sense of disconnection or do you feel a sense of connection i can say without doubt 
it is a strong sense of connection. I come back to Durban and feel like I didn't go anywhere. Wow. And, and, yeah, you know, so you just go back and you you fit in. Mm -hmm. You know, you hear the Afrikaans and the Zulu around you, mm -hmm. and you think, oh my goodness, I'm back home. I'm That's back it. Home. Yes, back home. And of course, it's it's really it's really nice to come back to Australia mm -hmm. when everything's over. It's nice to come back. But, you know, there's this tug at the heartstrings, of course. So I think to the expats who are feeling lonely, I think you've got to weigh it up. Um, understandably, there are going to be those setbacks. But if you want to stay where you are and you feel like you you can you can make it, I would say push forward. But, you know, there is this big drive at the moment. Wow. Return to South Africa. <laughs> and the point is not for me because I'm older. You know, it's, it just depends. Yeah. Take them back. You know, yeah. um, uh, thank you for that pearl because <laughs> I know for you the children were were very they were young they were extremely young when you they were very them. young yeah and I heard uh, Ryan speak he's a proper Australian he's I mean I think <laughs> he'd be very tough to hear that I'm sure <laughs> Ryan is an Australian man and uh, you know but I loved the way he melded with his South African family. When, oh, when for sure, for sure, yeah. Together. And I saw his interactions. He was well brought up in the sense that he had you for a mother and you obviously engaged with your children in such a way that even though these, these children are proper Australians, I mean, I met Ryan, <laughs> he's, yeah. he's, he's, he's definitely not South African. It, it, when he's in a South African hotel or at a restaurant, it, everybody's going to say, oh, that's an Australian man. But <laughs> he just... You know, he interacted with the country of his roots so beautifully. Uh, that oh, showed that is me, very good. Mm. That showed me per what level of teaching he had behind the scenes. To oh, become, thank you. That's good. Become the man that he is. Because he, I yeah. could see that he's a young man who's very respectful of the culture. Yes, of his yes. Birth, mm. And his grandparents, who were very mm, proud. Mm, for sure. Mm. He was very respectful. He honored it. And in a sense, he was in awe. And I love that. I think as human beings, if we are always in awe of mm -hmm. each other, that yeah. respect will, in a sense, erase all those issues that are calling, causing brain damage, like you know, looking at people differently, perceiving the wrong thing. It will change that way of thinking because those uh, perceptions uh, in principle mm -hmm came from an evil place, evil oh, system. Yes, yes. yes the yes. first man and woman and the first humans didn't have that. That developed over time. Mm, it's been socially constructed. Socially mm. constructed. And then people are trying to turn it into, no, this is my culture. It's not your culture. Cruelty can never mm. be somebody's culture. Racism can never be somebody's mm. culture. Your culture, your actual culture was damaged and you need mm. human. So therefore, I love what you bring to the party, Pearl. I love it because <laughs> from an you. academic perspective, why it's so exciting. I'm just thinking how you're changing young and old mindsets because today we have students across the board. They're different ages. You know, with online teaching, yeah, true, people true, of all true. ages are mm, starting to mm. go back to college. And I love that, that people don't stop learning. I think as long as we have a culture of people who do not stop learning, we will not only have a more intelligent society, we will have a more engaged society where people are in touch, sure. rather than mm. out of touch. And I think your work in the world is very, very uh, important as much as it's prominent, it's relevant, extremely relevant. So what are the changes that you are seeing among the students who come in for the first time? Maybe an immigrant a young person who comes to your university under your tutelage and then what's the difference when that person leaves what what have you seen over the years it's difficult to say what they do when they enter the world um but you know while they are with us while they are at the university and while they are undergoing some of the um programs that are there they are exploring the complexity of race and racial identity and the, the the position of immigrants and one of the things that we've used more recently which i think probably is telling when they when they leave us and go into school as teachers is that we challenge stereotypes through literature 
you know, so you're reading about the immigrant experience. You're reading about an inclusive society. You're reading about the narratives that have affected people who have come to settle here from outside, but also Indigenous Australians. So, you know, I, I am an avid reader like you, Mish, and um, Zaf said earlier as well that he's given up his uh, video gaming for books, which is exactly what it is. The what? literature, I think, is what, what you know, just moves us forward. And, you know, so I am I feel like if I can um, bestow that on students that I work with, that, you know, you are reading and understanding the experiences of other people through those books, then it's going to change the way that you think. So more recently, I've been advocating for this with my students, but also doing it myself, to read literature that actually positions the work of the First Nations, which is the Indigenous Australians, um, that highlight their culture and their history and how important it is for us to embrace what that is through mm -hmm. literature. So, um, you know, there are powerful books by an author called Jane Harrison. She's an older um, Aboriginal woman and writes beautifully, you know, plays and short mm -hmm. stories. And there are others um, like um, Wesley Enoch, who is a theatre director, and, and tell these stories so powerfully. And I think no one can walk away from that unchanged. You have no choice but to be changed because you are encountering somebody else's experience. So I think that's what I'd like to leave with many students that I work with because, you know, as an advocate for um, anti-racism, mm -hmm. the contribution you can make through education is through the books that you read. So, you know, it challenges you. It promotes that sense of racial equity it's making you think about a more inclusive society that is empathetic, like Zaf was saying, and more compassionate. Mm -hmm. And their voices are being heard. So, you know, that, that's some of the things that I, I would like to think. I said earlier I'm a Shakespeare buff, but that's, you know, the, the older literature. But, you know, I, and I read, read a great deal of, you know, the American literature as well. You know, the mm -hmm. advocacy, you know, like um, Ibram Kendi is a, is a really good writer historian and a professor as well and there are others like uh, Kimberly Crenshaw really really good and you know uh, Rennie Yellow Lodge is British I think and she's fabulous and so you you just wanted the, the, hers was a very funny book that I read last month which is called why I'm no longer talking to white people about race because <laughs> it's a funny title why I'm no longer talking to white people about race because you know she's she's addressing the fact that somehow as a person of color, you need to be the person who changes the world. You know, you've got to confront these contemporary realities of racism. Just do it. You know, don't don't mess around with. You know, people who can't do it any longer. That kind of thing. So I think that that scholarly reference point, probably through books, is the way that I'm going at the moment. <laughs> well, books will change the world. Oh, for sure. For sure. Uh, throughout the world, I'm seeing such a movement for the literacy. Mm. Uh, campaigns yes, in schools yes. and, and, and even amongst uh, adults as well. It's good to have people reading because I find a reading community is a thinking community. It's a less yes, biased community. Yes, yeah. You now have to, you know, you, you just got to think out of the box, so to speak. And uh, you know, so, so read read more books by um, authors of color. Yes. And, and yes. I say that to my students, read, read more books about yes. the experiences that they've had so that you understand it's not the same path for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it just challenges you, you know, so that, that, that's what we should be doing. That's what we should be doing. I mean, it's a learning curve on its own. Mm. Pearl, can I ask something of you? Can you, uh, you know, perhaps, I know you're such a busy person, but for our people of purpose, uh, I know they'd love this, for the for the Facebook page, because people are going in and they, they're looking at the page, well, they, 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 they're getting show information. But can you share perhaps your book list? Share it with me. Oh, for and sure. We, yeah, mm. just whenever, whenever you can, you know, mm. whatever you're reading, we'll just turn it into Pearl's reading corner or something. I'll ask them to, to just create something. A reading for list. Me. My goodness. Yeah. I think what it will do, it will promote better habits among all of us. We'll all read what you encouraging, and then we'll whoever's reading can come back onto the onto the. We can have a a, a sort of a gathering. And, and just discuss what we read, perhaps one book you recommend and that kind of thing. And you can lead the discussion because I think we can change. Thank you. Way. That is so good. What an, what an opportunity. Do you know Trevor Noah's book, Born a Crime, 
is on the text list in Australia. I don't don't know if you know this, wow. but it's on it, it is on the text list. And and when it came onto the text list, I thought, oh my goodness, I haven't read it, so I had to go ahead buy the book and read it. And of course, you know, every page comes alive to you, every yeah. single page. Yeah. And Trevor Scott because is amazing. It's talking I mean, about it's, South Africa. Yeah, yeah. Of course. And that, Very that period, which imagine being born a crime, and that story is just, it's all Trevor. Very but powerful. There are so many, so yes. many Trevors that happened over those, that So period. many Trevors, so many Trevors, yes. And I say that to the students who come up to me and talk about it, and I say, look, he's speaking as an uh, activist through that work. But remember, there are many, many people who have gone through this inequality. Mm -hmm. Many, many people. I mean, you know, so many mixed race people in South Africa, as you know. Yes. And to be a biracial mm. person. Yeah. Uh, well, it's it's sometimes a very misunderstood life. You you get, you know, you're loved in one community, you're hated in the other. And yeah. you struggle to find your way in society that, uh, well, people are writing about this, as Trevor wrote. And he, yeah, look what he did with his life. He turned it into a joke, actually. <laughs> but look, he's, he's, he's made a fortune out of doing that. A fortune out of, and he turned the whole, you know, it, it in a sense, it was a form of cruelty. Trevor was intrigued because he was just a child. He didn't know. But here he was, born a crime. It was a cruel thing. It and was. It was the Immorality Act in, you know, when he was born. Immorality Act. Yes. Yeah, the Immorality yes. Act, that was it, yes. Zach, Zach, do you know about that act? <laughs> yes, Probably. I'm, I love history, so I, yeah, I do know you a little bit about it. Oh, that's good, yeah. That's wonderful that you are in touch as a millennial. That act, what, there were many cruel acts, but that one, wow. No. That but, but there were so many, you know, it was group areas, it was areas. immorality. So many, I mean, you know, there's pictures online about, you know, the, 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 the past yes, the past laws and, and the curfews that existed even yeah. in Durban. And uh, you know, so, you know, where you, you couldn't be out at certain at certain times because I, that was problematic for the for the government. <laughs> yeah. People of colour, we were all born a crime. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, it, it, they had to address those other issues. Yeah. Um, and, and and if you look at it, you know, some we, we live with the legacy of that racial past at the yeah. moment. That's why. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yes, and that uh, thank you for mentioning that, Pearl. That legacy mm. is there. And mm. and the only way uh, to you know to get past that is to address and, and all of us have we mm. have to address. Am I a racist or not? Because I think everybody has. We can all be I mean, racist. We, we have no choice but to think about it. I, I did a paper called uh, Somehow oh. Everything is About Race. <laughs> Somehow Everything, because, because you, you, you can't know, think critically about it at all. Otherwise, yeah. sorry, Zach, you go ahead. You know, you know the funny thing about that, I thought I had this conversation the other day and uh, with, with someone who's uh, discriminating another culture, and I told them, you know what, another race. I told them, if you're in a life and death situation, right, and you need blood, are you going to question where the blood came from? Was it from that's a white true, person or black? That, you're gonna take the damn opinion. thing. Yep. So how can you be hypocritical about what someone looks like? If you need an mm -hmm. organ transplant. Are you gonna question? Did this person? Uh, did this person vote? Is this person racist? Does this person Good do this? Question. Question. No, question. you're gonna take it you, because you you need yep. it now. So in that way, yeah, <laughs> you, you begin to think how much of hypocrisy there is in this world, and uh, you, just, oh, yeah. you just sit back and laugh at it. You know. That's it. Yeah. But Paul, that paper you wrote, the one you mentioned. <laughs> I mean, if you are sure, it, it's probably on the net, right? It is probably on the net, yeah. Some of it are, are behind paywalls because some journals don't let you see everything. But well, yeah. how can we read it? Can you turn it into a book or something? Because it sounds very I can send the link. I, oh, I could turn, how wonderful would that be to turn it into a book? <laughs> yeah, because I'm telling you, that's the book I would want to read. Zach, what do you think? That's a book yeah, I would want to Yeah, <laughs> it sounds so interesting. Because when, when when you are South African, I mean, it's it's like Trevor Noah's book. It it, it changed your reality. Yeah. So you know you you started to think through the lens of race about everything, about mm -hmm. everything. Yeah. So to confront it, sometimes you just have to point out to everyone. You know what? Some for me, everything is about race. 
Well, you know, it was really wonderful speaking to you both. And Zach, you've been so interesting as yeah, I've been very, very challenged by that. Thank you, Zeph, for sharing Every, that. So everything yeah. you shared is so beautiful. And and even that um, uh, incident with that friend of yours, and you, well, you bring in your anecdotes, mm -hmm. and your, you've had personal life experience, and that's mm -hmm. wonderful. Mm -hmm. I love that you share that about yourself. There's just one thing, Zeph, because as much as we're discussing race and uh, racial inequality, which is mm. you know, prevalent in the world, we're also interested in human relationships like oh, dating yes. mm. and, you know, falling in love and that kind of thing. And I know you said you were comfortable to speak about this because you've had uh, a bad experience. And it was, as I said, cruelty is not an option. And we want to teach people, even if you're dating, do it nicely. If it's <laughs> not working out, be kind. I have a friend sure. who's a musician and uh, this woman ghosted him. I mean, she ghosted him. They had a date and then she ghosted him. But she made a mistake because he's a musician. He wrote a song and he made the song very famous. <laughs> so, Zaf, I'm giving you some points. So, so he turned he turned disaster into productivity and prosperity. Productivity. That's what creatives mm. do. You know, we, we, yep. we, we mm. take the pain mm. and we turn it into something. So, Zaf, would you like to tell us about your experience? With okay, this yeah. All right. <laughs> with the relationship and I, I, what happened oh my god all right Please so tell us, tell us yeah. about the text as well you know the, the whole thing because i want paul to hear this wow okay. all <laughs> right yeah all right so you know uh i wasn't looking for a relationship at the time and the funny story i know my mom's gonna be listening to this online but anyway oh. she was uh at a store and that person saw my picture on the phone and one thing led to another and next thing you know we were connected however you know because at the time there was a lot of pain that happened in my life where my pet mm -hmm. parrot passed away you know he was like the one pinnacle of hope everyone had and he had so much love to give if you have that pet at home you know you feel complete and when he passed away there was an open gap in my heart somewhere and i've been out of the dating world for about i would say close to about six years because i focused on myself and my vision and what i want to achieve and uh, that day i was given two opportunities one of them would have been probably to meet someone who is a doctor and the other one was the one I'm speaking about. So I said, you know what, <laughs> what the hell, let me just try this. And we went on the date and we clicked at the first, right? And uh, I didn't see the warning signs at first, right? So the love bombing happens, right? So it's like, oh my God, this person loves everything I love. Number one, if they love everything you love, something is wrong there. Right. So, yeah, we're not but the same people. But you didn't see the red flags or that. Did not pick up on that because I came from a place of giving love. So I yeah. felt, you know, this, this, this feels right. And then there was a lot of things uh, the person lied about. Uh, one of them was uh, smoking. And the person said, no, I, I'll, I'll give it up. And then two months later, no, I didn't give it up. I just told you that. So there was always this kind of sense of uh, unhappiness. Like if I did something good. It's good in the moment, but two days later, they'll touch back and say, no, I, I, didn't, I didn't like that, you know? So there was not something that I could do to fulfill that person anyway, because fulfillment comes from inside. And then the person ended up getting ill and I was there every single day, morning to night and looking after the person. And then uh, our relationship, as I like to say, you know, uh, it started to deteriorate, even though it seemed fine inside. I knew there was a sense of unhappiness. I didn't know where it was coming from. And uh, I started digging deeper into what was actually going on, right? The storm that was brewing. And uh, one thing I realized is everything that person said was a lie because they said their family doesn't like them, the mother, father. And one thing when I spent time there, I was like, these people really care for you. It's just that your understanding of what love is, is totally misinterpreted. Because uh, a few days later, then... Uh, I get a text. Now we we went we went to holidays and stuff together, so we had a lot of good times and moments and stuff. And uh, a few days later, you know, I get a phone call and she says, you know, uh, I don't think we should see each other and stuff like that. And then uh, I told her, you know, why? And she never gave a reason. And then she ended it over text. And I began to see, you know, it's so sad that this person never knew what love was. And yes, I was there every day for her, fed her, she slept next to me and stuff like that, looking after her. And then someone tells you that, you know what? I don't know what love is. Like love, you know, it's action words. It's not about buying someone things, it's about being there for them mm -hmm. in a time of need, in a time of celebration, in a time of sadness. Mm -hmm. So my 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 life coach reached out to me and says, Zaf, you know, I'm seeing you on Facebook and stuff, but you know what? I know 
something is happening and that's not love. That's what you think love is. And that hit me so hard because here I am. We planned our whole life together. And here it is me at night, literally crying myself to sleep. I was like, what's happening? And he says, Zaf, I can see that you have been taken on a different path in life. This is not you. This is what that person wants you to be. And uh, that's the thing when you, when you, when you're in a relationship with a narcissist, that's what happens. And I didn't know what a narcissist was at then, back then because I already came from a place of giving and loving and caring and forgiving. But for that person, it was never that. So I got roped into that. And what happened then, after that whole mess happened, I ended up very sick in December. So I picked up tuberculosis, as I mentioned earlier on. Oh, I was bedridden for seven months. You know, I was literally in my dying stages. That's how bad it was. And uh, I reached out to my friend in America. You know, I give so much credit to him, Dr. Bob Rakowski. And he told me a story about how he went through this as well. Not the disease, but the letdown where he met someone and they fell in love and they were going to get married. And she ended it over text and he had almost had a mental breakdown. And one thing he realized, you know what, that, that long time ago, like 30 years ago, that you know what, uh, he needs to move on with his life, but he doesn't know how. And he was guided onto how. And then a few weeks later, he met someone at the seminar. And that person today is his wife. They got, I think, four kids. They got 12 grandkids. So beautiful life. And he's, and then Pete Cohen, my life coach, told me the same thing. And uh, Pete, uh, what a wonderful guy. You'll got, you all will get to meet him because he will be back in South Africa as well. And uh, he told me he met a lady a long time ago, well over 20 years ago. And uh, he said she looked like Lady Diana, which was yeah. swept him off his feet, right? And uh, he said, you know, he had so much love for this person. She had a child and he accepted the child. But one thing he realized in his life that even though he loved her so much, he was being taken away from his path of helping people. He's one of the world's top keynote speakers. And he noticed that and he had to make a decision right there and then, which was very heartbreaking for him. That if he continues with this, he's not going to get to where he needs to be. And he had to end it right there. And he said one of the most painful things that he mm -hmm. ever done. But he did it in the most uh, calm and, and loving way possible by letting that person know that we love each other, but this is my journey and I have to go at it alone. And I think that's so important because if you can let someone down, let them down with love, let them know as well. It's not, it's not, it's not their fault. Sometimes you're just, you're just not compatible. And you got to come to an understanding and realize that not everything is forever. So whenever I leave people, I leave them in a sense of increase, something positive for them to move on. And unfortunately, uh, for the last three relationships I had before this, I realized there's a pattern there where I am rescuing someone without knowing I'm doing it. So I learned from that mistake. And uh, you can't save anyone. They need to save themselves. So when you... Feel like when someone says, you know, I'm lonely, I need to get into a relationship. Wrong idea. Wrong idea. You got to have so much love in you, so much love for people, so much love for nature. When you reach that level of love, now you can get into a relationship because you got something to give. A relationship will never give you nothing if you don't have anything to give. So most people enter relationships with the, with the idea of taking. So I tell mm -hmm. people, givers, know your limits because takers, they don't have any. So I'm alive today <laughs> and it was a challenging situation, but you know, I, I give people the best advice possible and how to pick up these little toxic traits and how to find yourself. Otherwise, you know what? Stress will consume you and you all know that the root cause of disease, sickness, illness, and death starts from stress. And you know, if you can figure a way on how to manage that, you'll live a lot better and a healthier life. Exactly. You, you evidently developed as a human being though, Zaf, as a result of those experiences. It strengthened you. It, it has. I had to, you know, you know, when, when I, when I, when I think about it, you know, um, my granddad, right. He was never the, the most religious Muslim. I can't ever recall him every, ever opening the Quran or going to mosque. But one thing I took from him is his love for people. When we sat on that table, he wasn't very wealthy. I was the first grandkid and he spoiled me the most, even though the others came, he still didn't care much for them. I was his number one. But when we sat on a table, right. I don't know where the food came from. It came from love. There was so much food mm -hmm. there and uh, the garden workers sat with us you know the house cleaners sat with us family sat with us neighbors sat with us there's so much of togetherness and i tell mm -hmm. people the one thing he taught me is to love people and that's one thing i will continue doing because his sons or one of them is my father don't have that quality you know i told them y'all missed out so much because mm -hmm. he has so much to give and you'll never learn from that mm -hmm. so I, I live my life that way love people care for people and help people if they want to be helped Wonderful. And you know what? When the time is right, the right person will come. 
Singapore, we'll sure. meet you. You'll find each other. I always say you'll find each other. And yeah. uh, who hasn't had heartbreak as a young person? You know, that's out there. And the thing is, we've experienced that. So we know how you felt. And it's very cruel. I mean, 21st century breakups are just so heartless. By yeah, it's through text messaging. My goodness. Wow. After having, uh, you know, a relationship with someone, that's cruel. That's very cruel. But do you know that that's actually saying more about the other person than it's yeah. saying about that. Yeah. yeah, because that person obviously needs a great deal of work in their own lives to be yeah. as insensitive as that. Mm. It, it did it, it, it did come across that because when I did a lot of study and research into what happened and I noticed that the previous relationships of that person where they told me like one of the person they dated was uh, a drug addict, one of the person was verbally abusive and here comes me, none of that, always forgiving, that became a problem. It's like, why won't you fight with me? It's like, there's no mm. reason to fight. Like my mind is always searching for solutions and not more problems. So in that the sense... The other brain needed healing. The other brain yes. needed mm -hmm. Childhood trauma. Yeah. Childhood trauma. So, Zaf, good on you for mm -hmm. standing up for yourself. Thanks. Because we have to stand up for ourselves. If we don't stand yeah. up for ourselves sure. first, you know, people take advantage. And, and sometimes that's the first response to life for someone who hasn't learned properly. And there are many who haven't learned properly. Mm -hmm. We hope that through this platform and many others, including yours, and also holds uh, a life of teaching mm -hmm. uh, just mm -hmm. because you're teaching at, at the end of the day Pearl your teaching is about being a good decent human being that's what oh, you mean. for sure absolutely yeah. you cannot have a bunch of doctorates to your name when you're just nasty you know nobody likes oh, no. you. yes <laughs> yes exactly yeah yeah bring the American on there Michelle you cannot <laughs> oh, you just cannot nasty. <laughs> you've got to be a kind gentle yes. compassionate mm -hmm. we were created to be kind gentle mm -hmm. compassionate people look we can be we all have our moods and our moments but cruelty is a whole other thing that's and, true yeah and zap i'm really really sorry from my heart that you have been mm -hmm. through it must have been and and that you became so ill and may we also be part of your healing journey now that we're all friends I'll, i'm sure pearl will be more than willing to connect oh, absolutely yeah because you would be a great, you know, for, for the kind of work she does, she would love to reach out to you and you can reach out to her. Absolutely. Yeah. Have conversation around that. And uh, you know, it was such a joy having you both here. Thank you we, for having us, Michelle. We've been we've done well today and it was such a marvelous conversation. I could good go conversation. On. It was a good one. It was a really good one. And Paul, you met a new friend, Zach. You met a new oh, friend. Oh, for sure. For sure. A millennial, but so I love the millennial. You're just a bunch of people. You're really you're the next world. You you're ruling. So on Monday we are having girl chat. Pearl is out of your time zone, but I will share what goes on there. But here's the interesting thing: we have a surprise guest. Wow, wonderful! Surprise guest, you're coming at the end. So. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, a whole bunch of women. We're expecting a hundred women. Oh, and that's wonderful. Yeah, so we're discussing uh, very interesting topics. We, we've got legal, uh, a legal expert oh, discussing the law and women. We have a property expert, uh, women and property. Then we have a wealth creation expert. She's coming to talk about how women can create wealth for themselves. And then we have two women. I think you would have watched the show with uh, Pinky Kolong and Lindy Nala. They were they are high profile career women, were, and they nuclear plant uh, power plant professionals. Oh my goodness! Excellent. Then, yes. You know, cyber security and Pinky is um, she's supply chain and also she's an engineer by she studied to be an Wonderful. engineer. Wonderful. Mm. So they were former victims of abuse. Uh, Pinky was. I did watch. I did watch both their stories so on your was, previous show. Yeah. In fact, both of them were victims of narcissists. Pinky mm. suffered emotional abuse and mm. Lindy was actually physically abused. So they mm. will be on, on the sh show on Monday talking about narcissism and the type of abuse that uh, emanates. Yeah. So it's just to inform and we're closing up with our Women's Day program uh, with that. 
just to Excellent. make people, we even want the narcissist to watch because we want them healed. The world yes. doesn't have to be this way. But also we want to warn the younger and older female populations, not just in SA, but around the world, what to look out for the red flags. And mm -hmm. so Zach was very kind. Uh, mm, to he, share that, for sure. Mm. He's, he'll be coming into round often. I, if the women watch this, then they're going to know you're the surprise. Mm. But he comes out on the program because we wanted to surprise them with, you know, his entrance at the end of it, because I think his input, especially his story of what he's been through. Of course, I think that'll be so powerful. Yeah, It's very powerful. And it tells us that not only women go through, men also face female narcissists. So the question is, how do we heal this in society? But I suppose mm -hmm. that would be a whole other discussion. You both have been beautiful. Thank you for your time. Thank you for coming on board. And... Um, may the movement grow absolutely thank you michelle Definitely. thank you for having thanks us. thank You're you welcome. thanks god bless pearl and thank uh, you go to your favorite instagram cafe and send me a picture of your favorite uh, your recent treat as, you as i always do <laughs> as you know <laughs> that we share treats from across we do from across the world lovely across. we share them <laughs> with our phones we take pictures of our it has to be a sugary treat. We both addicted. Must be sugary. Okay. I cut Some, sugar something. nine years ago. <laughs> we, love, we love baked treats. If it's baked, yes. then it's, it's down, down our street. We just love it. Absolutely. We go in search of the best baked treats. And if we buy cake, it just can't be cake. It has to be the, that kind of cake. So yeah. we, that, we've yes, been... the ones that's going to hit the spot. Exactly. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> this, this Easter 2024, Pearl had me on a a hot cross bun challenge because in Australia they have so many varieties. Oh, I did. Yeah. And it was fascinating. So I went in search of uh, a few. We don't have that many here in the West. And, and you did find a few though, Michelle. I found a few in yes. Nice yeah. places and, yeah. and they, they were lovely. But I was just fascinated with the, the baking movement in Australia. You you guys are in, in that patisserie level. And you know that. a number of different kinds of hot cross buns. Wow, it was amazing. Mm. So, Zach, welcome to our world. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much. I love it. Yeah. World. Thank you, well, Michelle. Thank, Thank you. you. God bless you both. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.